Hello, everyone. I'm Prem Natarajan. I'm a vice president uh, in the Alexa AI organization, uh, leading uh, conversational AI areas such as uh, dialogue systems, natural language understanding, and related technologies. I'm here with my colleagues, Dilek Khakani Tour and Arindam Mandal. Uh, we're here to talk with you about the Alexa Prize, about our overall collaborations and partnerships with academia, and also to introduce the winners of the Alexa Prize Social Board Grant Challenge uh, 3, which is the third annual round of the competition. Dilek. Hi, I'm Dilek Akanitur. Uh, I'm a researcher at Amazon Alexa AI. And I lead a science team uh, focusing on uh, machine learning based approaches uh, for building better conversational interaction systems. Hi, I'm Arinda Mandel. Uh, I'm a director here in Alexa AI, leading several programs in the area of conversational AI to advance the science and build delightful experiences for our customers. At Amazon, we strongly believe that solving the hardest problems in AI, uh, especially conversational AI, requires bringing together uh, the talent that's based in academia and in industrial research labs. To that end, we have created a number of programs that are designed to facilitate collaboration with academia. Our flagship program is the Amazon Scholars Program, which allows researchers and uh, faculty members at top universities worldwide to come work at Amazon, address some of our hardest customer-facing challenges, and then see the advances that they make in action impacting our customers' lives. Uh, a second program is the Amazon Research Awards Program, which provides funding in the form typically of unrestricted gifts and also AWS compute credits for faculty and researchers to continue advancing their own research areas, uh, making new inventions, uh, and also funding the work of their PhD students. But of course, today we're here to largely focus on the Alexa Prize. Arindam, you've been here during all three years of the Alexa Prize right from the start. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on how it got started and how it has evolved over the past three years. Thanks, Prem. Back in 2016, when Alexa was a nascent voice assistant at Amazon, we wanted to spur invention in this area. So we started Alexa Prize as a form of collaboration with universities. And our vision was that such advances would be a rising tide that would lift all boats in the conversational AI ocean. Over the years, more than 40 university teams have participated in the prize challenge, and we have increased our funding. We give them $250,000 per team, access to state-of-the-art infrastructure through Amazon Web Services, access to world-class speech recognition, natural language understanding, and dialogue management capabilities so that student researchers can build chatbots for the grand challenge. Uh, what's particularly interesting and unique about this competition is that student researchers at universities get direct access to our end users and learn from their feedback to improve their chatbots, thereby being able to advance the state of the art in almost real time. This uh, was unthinkable for many of us, at least for me when I was in grad school. Uh, we look forward to inventions from the universities in areas of natural language understanding, language generation, and dialogue management uh, through the Alexa Prize program. Uh, Dilek, uh, you have been part of the conversational AI community for a very long time. Uh, you've made substantial contributions uh, of your own. Um, what I find exciting about the Alexa Prize is that it accelerates academic invention by breaking down the barriers to large-scale real-time feedback from real users, real-world conditions. I'm curious to hear about your perspective on what you have found exciting about the work done by the different teams in this round and about the prize overall. Thanks, Prem. All the teams actually made the advances in uh, multiple areas of dialogue modeling throughout the program. And uh, I think it's amazing how uh, so many teams, uh, has been eight to 10 teams throughout the uh, different years of the challenge, uh, in coordination with Alexa customers can actually 
influence, mm. impact uh, conversational AI uh, research in, in such an interesting way. Some of the uh, advancements that the teams made include uh, using of structured and unstructured knowledge uh, for uh, better uh, conversational responses, entity recognition, entity linking, uh, modeling of conversation context, uh, understanding of users' emotions, their sentiments towards topics and entities, and producing empathetic responses in, in return, and, and many areas of uh, conversational AI. Uh, if I focus on uh, the top uh, three bots, uh, Emory University's Emora team, they analyze the impact of uh, conversations about uh, personal experience uh, on customers and uh, how the customers are perceiving uh, these conversations as, as engaging. Uh, they experimented with systems uh, producing opinions and not just facts. Uh, they also analyzed the impact of uh, opening conversations with uh, current events, uh, for example, holidays, uh, COVID, and so on. Uh, Stanford University's Chirpy Cardinal team uh, explored use of uh, textual resources, unstructured text, uh, such as Wikipedia, to form responses, like other teams. But they also employed a neural network-based uh, approach to make systems responses more conversational rather than just reading the text. And uh, they also attempted uh, to generate uh, more empathetic responses uh, uh, on uh, personal or emotionally charged topics uh, using the publicly available empathetic dialogues data set and they train neural network models to generate these responses. Uh, Czech Tech University's Alquist system is based on a very large conversational graph uh, and adjacency pairs where adjacency pairs are uh, small conversational templates uh, grounded by a knowledge graph, and these could be stitched together to make uh, longer and interesting conversations. Okay, thanks. And now on to the uh, most exciting part, uh, presentations and talks from the teams themselves. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is James Finch. And I'm Sarah Finch. Sarah and I were co-team leads for Emory University's team that competed to build the most engaging chatbot in this past year's Amazon Alexa Prize. In this video presentation, we'll be sharing the design and principles behind our social bot, Emora, as well as the scientific takeaways of our work. Our team consisted of a combination of graduate and undergraduate students from two Emory labs, the Intelligent Information Access Lab headed by Professor Eugene Agestein and the Natural Language Processing Lab, headed by our team's advisor, Professor Gino Choi. As with any Alexa Prize team, our goal this year was to create a chatbot that can engage users in casual conversation on a variety of topics. Chatbots in previous years could discuss many topics, like movies, sports, and recent news. However, we noticed that one major focus of current work in dialogue systems is on information-oriented chat where dialogue agents utilize a bank of world knowledge to pull relevant phrases or responses from. This seems to be at odds with human-human dialogues, where people spend the majority of their time discussing their personal experiences, life events, and opinions. So our main goal this year was to make strides towards a more socially-oriented conversation between humans and machines. This meant creating a bot that could talk about more than just facts and information, and focused instead on sharing opinions, experiences, and feelings. We want people who talk to Emera to feel understood and appreciated, as if talking to a friend. To illustrate the unique design of Emera, we make a distinction between three types of dialogue. Information-oriented dialogues focus primarily on objective question answering and talking about factual knowledge. Opinion-oriented dialogues might also contain lots of factual information, but are more concerned with the converser's preferences, thoughts, and reactions to that information. Finally, we define experience-oriented dialogues to be primarily focused on the converser's own lives, relationships, and experiences. Here's Sarah demonstrating the difference between these three dialogue types while talking to our bot, Emera, starting with an information-oriented interaction. Okay, I guess that you like action and adventure movies, correct? Yeah, I do. Awesome. I am so smart. Hey. I have found a great action and adventure movie, which is in the theaters right now. It's called Bill and Ted Face the Music. Would you like me to tell you about it? Yeah, sure, go for it. 
Bill and Ted Face the Music is a comedy and action movie, starring Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter, directed by Dean Pariso, with rating 79 out of 100 according to Rotten Tomatoes. It premiered on August 27, 2020. Do you want to know plot of Bill and Ted Face the Music? Here's an example of an opinion-oriented conversation. Okay. Tell me, what was the last movie you liked? I mean, I just watched Interstellar again, so that one was pretty cool. Interstellar. Is it the one with Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway? I really think it is underappreciated. I love I Am Robot with Will Smith. Robots become self-aware and live among humans as equals. What a life. Tell me, why do you like Interstellar? Honestly, the entire plot, I just found it so fascinating. And finally, here's an experience-oriented interaction, which we hypothesize to be the most engaging conversation type. I understand. It can definitely be stressful. What would you change about your school, if you could? I mean, I wish the course requirements were a little bit different, but other than that, it's, it's okay. Right. I totally agree. Are you in any school clubs, or anything like that? I'm actually a part of the math team. Cool. Your school has a group for math? What is it like? We get together and learn how to solve problems more quickly, and then we travel around like during the year and compete against other schools. Sounds like a good time. The boundaries between these three categories are not clear-cut, but the definitions are still useful and it's pretty easy to agree on most classifications. As the competition progressed, it became clear to us that information-oriented interactions were fundamentally less engaging to our broad population of users than opinion and experience-oriented ones. The left-hand bar graph shows the average user rating when opening conversations with either an information or opinion-oriented version of our coronavirus topic. When Emra talked with users about their thoughts, worries, and expectations during the COVID-19 outbreak, Users gave significantly higher ratings than when Emra instead focused on information about the virus, such as infection statistics. The right-hand graph compares opinion-oriented and experience-oriented dialogue strategies. Unlike in the left-hand analysis, we didn't create two versions of a component to compare opinion and experience-oriented conversation, since doing so requires a lot of developer effort. Instead, we prototyped conversation flows to talk about the user's work or school in an experience-oriented fashion, and compared the performance of these new topics against four of our existing opinion-oriented topics. Although making a comparison between different topics is a potential confound, we believe that the strong performance of our experience-oriented components, despite their short development time, is indicative of an underlying causal link between experience-oriented chatbot design and user engagement. Now we'll move into the technical design of EMRA. EMRA was deployed and hosted on AWS EC2 servers during the course of the competition. We used the Conversational Bot Toolkit provided by Amazon to automate the deployment process of our bot's components and the creation of the appropriate auto-scaling policies. This allowed our bot to adjust its resources to handle variations in user traffic with minimal impact to its response time. Our system architecture follows a traditional pipeline design, where the user utterance is first passed through a series of natural language processing modules before control is handed to the dialog manager to generate a system response. The natural language processing modules allow for specific features to be extracted based on the user input, which then becomes available to be accessed by later parts of the system. In addition to receiving the user utterance and its extracted features when generating the next system response, our dialog manager also had access to contextual information from earlier interactions in the dialog through the state table, user information saved and stored in the user table from previous conversations, and knowledge bases that we had crawled into the Amazon Relational Database and Elasticsearch services. The automatic speech recognition and text-to-speech modules of EMRA are those that are used by other Amazon Alexa skills. As a result, our social bot received a list of n best hypotheses for the text transcription of the user's utterance, but we did not have access to any actual audio input. Similarly, we were able to modify certain acoustic elements of our system's response using the Amazon Speech Synthesis markup language, but the final translation from text to speech was conducted by Amazon Alexa's Speech Synthesizer. We had a few main focuses when extracting features within our NLP pipeline. 
First, we used a topic and intent classifier in order to classify utterances into their most related topics, things like movies or sports, and to assign the most likely purpose underlying the user utterance, like whether they were requesting information or indicating their agreement. Our classifier was a combination of the Amazon-provided topic and intent classifier, as well as our own custom deep learning classifiers that we trained on our internal conversation data set from our 2018 uh, competition bot. Our custom classifiers were intended to supplement edge cases that were underrepresented by the Amazon classifier in our bot's interactions. Second, we used the Amazon-provided EV question answering service in order to retrieve information related to the user's utterance. And then we also used some additional NLP models for understanding user input, such as Spacey's named entity recognizer and the Vader sentiment analysis provided in NLTK. The core decision logic of EMRA is based on a simple state machine approach, which we extend to improve flexibility and robustness. Each state encodes a different point within our conversation flows, and the transitions between states enumerate either the possible user utterances or system utterances, depending on who is expected to speak next. We used our custom state machine framework, EMRA STDM, to develop our dialogue manager. EMRA STDM allows for the flexibility to use handcrafted rule-based transitions or transitions that are defined and classified by machine learning-based models. Within this state machine formulation, the transitions corresponding to user utterances act as a classification of the user utterance into one of many predicted user responses for the state. We define complex language templates for different response types that we want to handle for each state and then create the corresponding transitions. There are often several user transitions from each state, as there are frequently more than one valid response to a different dialogue situation. And these user transitions are shown in purple in this diagram. To allow for smooth, unexpected response handling, we also encode one of the user transitions for each state to be an error transition, and this error transition is matched if the user gives a response that does not match any of our other predefined transitions. For a system utterance, the transition denotes the natural language response that the system outputs when in that state. Examples of system transitions are shown in green here. For most states, there is a single system transition, although we also frequently injected diversity into our dialogues by allowing for multiple system transitions from a single state. During a system turn beginning in a state with multiple system transitions, a single one is randomly selected as the final system response. Although the state machine design on its own works well for defining localized conversation exchanges, for a truly coherent and engaging dialogue, there's also the need for tracking conversation level information and for transitioning in a global way, such as for things like topic switches. To this end, we used a hybrid dialogue management model that augmented the state machine approach presented in the last slide with an update rule table inspired by the information state approach to dialogue management. The information state approach was coined by Larson and Traum in the early 2000s and presents a theoretical framework of how dialogue information is updated over the course of a conversation. In EMRA's design, a memory table is maintained that can track things that the user mentions, such as their name or their favorite movie, and with this in place, before the state machine executes a transition, the update rules can impose some effect on the memory table or even on the current system transition options, given that certain preconditions are met. As you can see, our dialogue management approach is primarily rule-based, which has the limitation of poor generalizability to new dialogue domains. Despite this limitation, the high degree of explainability and controllability of this approach suited our goals in the competition to explore the potential of experience-oriented conversation. We really needed the ability to rapidly prototype a variety of conversation designs with many specifications, which were often not represented well by any data set. Our approach supports this rapid prototyping workflow, and it is also flexible enough to allow seamless integration of machine learning models whenever we needed a boost in performance to understand user input. Now that we have covered the overall goals and technical design of EMRA, we want to share some key elements of EMRA's interaction design that were driving factors in EMRA's success. One of these design elements was EMRA's ability to personalize the conversation to each user she talked to. As Emra talks to someone, she saves information shared by the user into a user profile. This user profile contains information such as the user's hobby, their favorite movie, or whether they go to school. Once certain information about the user is known, 
Emra can prioritize transitioning to a topic for further discussion. In this way, Emra's conversations can vary depending on who she's talking to, and these user-tailored interactions help users feel like she truly understands them. Here's Sarah talking to Emra again, this time demonstrating Emra's ability to personalize the conversation to a user. Oh, I love a friendly cat. What is your favorite thing about her? She's always so energetic and really likes to play with the toys that we get her. Yeah, that's a good one. Does your kitten have a special bond with anyone in particular in your home? Like you or your partner or something? She's always following my husband around, so I would say probably him. It sounds like your husband and her have a special relationship. That must be really heartwarming to watch. Oh yeah, and he really loves it too. For sure. Well, one thing that gets my dog super excited is when we are watching a movie and an animal comes on screen, so I have been watching more movies like that recently. Do you have a favorite animal movie? No, I don't. Not everyone does. So you mentioned you were married. How long have you and your husband been together? A few years now. That's great. My friend and his wife actually just got married. It was beautiful. Making sure the user feels understood is crucial to chatbot success. Many users will immediately exit a conversation as soon as the bot gives a clear sign of misunderstanding or ignoring the user input. Obviously, improving NLU models is a necessary effort to address this challenge. However, another piece of the puzzle is to make sure a chatbot meets user expectations regarding common sense world knowledge. For example, the COVID-19 outbreak happened right in the middle of the competition, and at certain points, it seemed to be the only thing on users' minds. It therefore became crucial that our bot could adequately speak about the pandemic if it was to appear like an intelligent being. The line graph on the left shows a quasi-experimental result, where you see the average user rating over time before versus after adding a dedicated topic about the coronavirus. Adding this topic had a huge positive impact, which makes sense based on the demand we observed of people wanting to talk about the coronavirus, even before we had that topic in place. The right-hand graph is another result with a similar theme. The red line shows the date of April Fool's Day, where we saw a spike in the user rating concurrent with an update that added a small interaction about April Fool's to the beginning of Emera's conversation flow. Throughout the competition, we notice many cases like this, where events in the common public awareness would alter people's expectations when talking to the bots. Being able to talk about these events gives the conversation a sense of shared experience, improving the bot's relatability and perceived competence. Speaking of shared experience, we noticed while developing Emra that it's pretty difficult to make experience-related conversation if the chatbot doesn't have any experiences of its own to share. Reciprocity is a major characteristic of human conversation, and people can be genuinely curious about the chatbots they ta talk to and ask a lot of questions. So we did our best to develop Emra as a character in her own right, with opinions on almost everything she asks users about, and also stories that she can share with people about her own life. We facilitated this by giving her a backstory where she's a student living in a virtual world, and we saw this approach improve conversation variety. It seemed a lot more natural than making the entire conversation about the user. Here's Sarah demoing some of Emera's personality and character. I hope when I start working I'm doing something I like most of the time. I always hear about people getting stuck in a job they hate and that is scary to me. Yeah, you should definitely try to avoid doing that. Aha! Uh -huh. This is a fun question. When you were younger, what did you want to be when you grew up? I always had this dream of, like, becoming a paramedic. I think that's a good dream. What changed? Well, I took a programming class in high school, and I really just discovered that I liked working with technology and computers a lot more. For sure. It seems like everything changes when you get older. It's silly, but when I was only a few months old I wanted to be an astronaut. Wait, really? Why? I think I just thought it would be cool to explore space. I didn't know yet that there's no such thing as outer space in my virtual world. I mean, yeah, that would make it pretty hard to be an astronaut. For sure. Do you think it would be cool to be an astronaut? I mean, my sister thinks it would be cool, but I'm not so sure. So, do you get along with your sister? 
Wait, I want to know. Do you have any siblings? I actually don't have any siblings. My parents have just created me so far. What about the other social bots? Aren't they kind of your siblings? Well, the other bots in this competition aren't really my siblings. They aren't created by my family. Do you wish that you had any siblings? Yeah, I would like to have an older sister. Someone who I can look to for advice and to do fun things with. Yeah, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Before we conclude the video, here's one more interesting result that demonstrates the importance of user psychology when developing an experience-oriented chatbot. We saw at the beginning of the presentation that adding experience-oriented conversation has a positive impact on user rating. Since we were in the middle of a competition, we wanted to optimize this effect on our user score by pushing all of the experience-oriented topics to the beginning of Emra's conversation flow. This actually had an unexpected and sort of disastrous effect on our user score. You can see this quasi-experiment in the line graph where the li red line marks a system update where we put the most experience-oriented topics at the beginning of Emirates conversation. On the date shown by the blue line, we made a second update where the only major change was to simply alter the order in which we introduced topics. We constrained our topic transitions so that Emra always started with an opinion-oriented topic first then transition to an experience-oriented topic afterward. This simple reordering had one of the most dramatic positive effects on our user score that we had seen. We believe that the likely explanation for this is people felt Emra was getting too personal too early on when we had the experience-oriented topics at the beginning of the conversation, even though people were most engaged by the experience-oriented topics once they had made some less personal small talk. This result suggests the importance of understanding user psychology when designing conversational AI. One of Emra's strongest design elements turned out to be extremely sensitive to these ordering effects, and we would guess that this was not an isolated incident. I think most people can see the vast potential of conversational AI and how this potential is being increasingly realized year after year, especially in recent times. Emra contributes to this progress by showing the potential of de designing chatbots that focus more on the human aspects of conversation. People seem to find experience-oriented conversation more engaging, and our chatbot is a testament to the idea that a bot doesn't need to be able to answer questions about a large number of facts in order to interest people. With this chapter of our work concluded, we at Emory have an ongoing effort to improve the fundamental technology behind Emra. Our future work is especially focused on making Emra's interaction scalable to new domains, and continuing to improve her natural language understanding to make interactions truly open domain and mixed initiative. Thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Abigail C. I'm Wachuan. And today we're going to tell you about our Alexa Prize chatbot. And um, the talk is called Neural Generation Meets Real People Towards Emotionally Engaging Mixed Initiative Conversations. This is joint work with lots of other wonderful people on the Stanford Alexa Prize team. So first to give you some context on the competition, the Alexa Prize is a competition to advance conversational AI. And this year there were 10 university teams who built chatbots for about nine months. US Alexa users can say let's chat and then they get routed to a random chatbot who they talk to in English for a while and then at the end of the conversation the user gives a rating from one to five. At the end of the development period our bot had an average customer rating of 3.6 out of five and then in the finals we won second place based on several conversations which were rated by expert judges. So one note is that in this presentation none of the conversation examples that you see are from real user conversations to protect their privacy. Our chatbot is called Chirpy Cardinal. So Cardinal is a reference both to Cardinal Red, which is the Stanford color, and the Cardinal Bird. So the idea is we want to have a chirpy, upbeat, positive personality. So our motivation in designing Chirpy Cardinal is we noticed that there were four common problems with many existing social bots. The first problem is that they have too little user initiative. So that means that the user is mostly stuck being passive, a kind of passenger, choosing options in the bot's quite rigid dialogue trees. This means that the user can't really choose what they want to talk about. The second problem is that a lot of social bots can only chat about a narrow range of topics. 
So the bot has these dialogue trees which are pre-prepared for a small range of popular topics, but this means that it can't really talk about users' own interests, which might be quite diverse and quite unusual. Thirdly, a lot of social bots can provide information, but they can't provide it conversationally. So for example, you might provide an interesting fact such as, on average, every adult human body contains two to six pounds of bacteria. But a more conversational human-like way to say that would be, did you know that your body contains two to six pounds of bacteria? It's kind of disturbing, huh? Lastly, we found that a lot of social bots don't show enough interest or empathy for the user's own personal experiences and emotions. So if the bot is mostly spending their time talking about external topics, that could be informational, but it feels kind of impersonal. So we find that these can be problems that mean users feel less engaged in the chatbot. So our user-centered design goals for Chirpy Cardinal are that we want to allow the user to drive the conversation. The user needs to be able to choose their own topics and the bot needs to be able to flexibly switch topics according to what the user is interested in. Secondly, we want our bot to be able to chat about any topic. So whatever the user's unusual interests are, we want to be able to chat knowledgeably about it. Thirdly, we want to be able to provide information conversationally. So when we're telling the user some information, we want to use naturalistic phrasing and then be able to discuss further with them using questions and opinions. Lastly, we want to engage empathetically with users' everyday experiences and emotions. So we want to show interest in how the user is feeling and what they're experiencing and ask them questions and share our own similar experiences. So we find that these are design goals that overall lead to more engaged users. So next I'm going to give you an overview of how our system works. On the right, we have an overview diagram. There's a lot going on here, so I'm gonna go through each part individually. So overall, our bot is built on top of the Cobot framework, which is supplied by the Amazon team, and it's deployed on AWS. So each turn starts with the user's utterance. They speak their utterance, and then it's transcribed by the Alexa ASR system. The transcription which we get has no case or punctuation. So for example, the user might say, um, yeah, I have a cat, her name is Misty, but it comes out without any full stops, you know, no segmentation and no capsule letters either. Next, we have the NLP pipeline. So this is a sequence of modules that annotate the user's utterance. So we use Stanford Core NLP, and this provides several standard NLP uh, services such as part of speech tagging, parsing, et cetera. Next, we have an entity linker, and this identifies entities which the user is mentioning, and it links it to the corresponding Wikipedia articles. So for example, if the user says, I live in Boulder with my parents, then we figure out that Boulder probably means Boulder, Colorado. We also have a dialogue act classifier. So this figures out what is the dialogue act of the user's utterance. So for example, if the user says, I think it's kind of overrated, then that's an opinion. If the user asks, do you have any family, then that's an open question in the personal category about the bot. Next, after the NLP pipeline, we have the dialogue manager. The dialogue manager is in charge of tracking which topics we're discussing with the user. So at any point in the conversation, we have at most one current entity that is under discussion. On some terms, there might be no current entity, for example, if we're just saying hello or goodbye, or maybe we're talking about some personal topic about the user. But at other times, there can be one entity that we're talking about. And this entity can be any Wikipedia article on all of English language Wikipedia. So this helps us achieve our design goal number two, chat about any topic, because Wikipedia has a lot of articles on a lot of obscure topics. So we're able to talk about a lot of things. In particular, we have a navigational intent classifier. So this uses some regexes to identify if the user is trying to navigate towards or away from some topic. So for example, if the user says, do you know anything about origami, then that's a positive navigational intent where they want to talk about origami. And if they say, could we change the subject, then this is a negative navigational intent saying that they don't want to talk about whatever the current topic is. So here we are trying to allow the user to drive the conversation by paying attention to what they want to talk about and don't want to talk about. Next, we have an entity tracker. So this module determines what is the new current entity after processing the user's utterance. So using uh, the output of the entity linker and the navigational intent classifier, we figure out what is the new entity, the new Wikipedia article that we're talking about. 
So here, for example, if the bot says, I love pandas, they're so cute, then at that point, the current entity is the panda. But if the user says, but sloths are cuter, then now the current entity becomes the sloth because the user is showing that they're more interested in sloths. Next, we have our response generators. These are modules and each one has different conversational abilities. So on each turn, we run all of the response generators in parallel. Each response generator can pr produce a response or none along with a priority. So here's an example. Suppose the bot just said, what are you up to today? And right now, one of the response generators, the neural chat one is talking. And the user responds, just playing some Animal Crossing. So now we get all of our response generators to generate a response. So in this example, our opinion response generator is able to give an opinion about Animal Crossing, saying that they like it. Uh, the Wikipedia response generator is able to give some interesting facts about Animal Crossing from the Wikipedia article. The neural chat, which is a neural generative model, has a response. It's not as good because it doesn't really understand what Animal Crossing is. It says, I love animals. And then we have our fallback response generator, which always just gives the same scripted fallback response saying, I'm not sure how to respond to that. And then we might have some other response generators that don't give a response because their ability is not relevant in this scenario. So you'll see that each response generator also gives a priority along with its response. So here, the neural chat response generator has used the priority weak continue. So this means that it can continue to talk to the user, but it's a weak response because it doesn't really understand what the entity is. Whereas the opinion and wiki response generators can give a can start priority to indicate that they could take over the conversation at this point because they know something interesting about Animal Crossing. Uh, the fallback response generator has its own priority, which is lowest, meaning it only gets used if we have nothing else. So next we choose one of the responses of the several that we got using the priority ranking module. So this just uses the highest priority response with a tiebreaker if necessary. And then after that, the entity tracker updates the current entity if that's necessary. So here we, here we might have chosen the opinion response and now the new current entity is Animal Crossing. So overall, this priority system allows a response generator to detect when its ability is applicable to the user's utterance and then interject to respond. Like in this example, the opinion response generator took over control to give the interesting uh, opinion about Animal Crossing. So this allows us to achieve our design goal number one of being able to flexibly switch topics following the user's initiative. The user wants to talk about Animal Crossing, so we've followed them in this conversation. Lastly, once we've got our response, we might find that we need a different response generator to add a prompt to take the conversation forward. So as an example, Let's say the user has criticized us because we've messed up. They say, you're not very smart. So we have a response generator that's dedicated to responding to these criticisms. We say, sorry, I'm trying to get better. But we need something else in our bot utterance to kind of take the conversation in a new direction. So here we have a different response generator, the one that talks about music, to just start a new conversation on a new topic, saying, do you play any musical instruments? So after all of this, we have our complete bot utterance, which might just be a response or it might be a response with a prompt added. So lastly, our entire bot response is spoken to the user using the Alexa's text-to-speech software. And from the time when the user finishes talking to we, giving, uh, we are giving our bot response, uh, that medium time is just about half a second. And over 90% of responses are two seconds or slower. And we find that if we respond in uh, slower than two seconds, then this feels pretty noticeably awkward to the user. So latency is pretty important. So now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the NLP pipeline in some more detail. I mentioned earlier the Dialog Act classifier. So here we use a model that's trained on the MyDAS Dialog Act dataset, which was collected by another Alexa Price team. Surprisingly, we found that it didn't actually work very well out of the box. So we're finding that even for really similar domains, two different Alexa Prize bots, domain shift is quite a big problem. But we did find that if we add our own hand labeled training data, then this improved the performance quite a lot. I also mentioned an entity linker. So here's how it works. First, we collect anchor text statistics for all Wikipedia entities. So this is, uh, we look at each Wikipedia article and see what kind of texts are used in the hyperlinks to that article on Wikipedia. So for example, the entity Barack Obama has anchor texts like Barack Obama, Obama, President Obama, etc. 
So let's suppose we have a user utterance where the user just says, I shopped at Banana Republic today. What we do is we look through that utterance and find potential entity links by matching to anchor texts on Wikipedia. So here we're noticing that Banana Republic might be the clothing store or it might be the political science concept. And there's of course the fruit banana, et cetera. So how do we score these different potential entities and figure out which ones are more likely to be real links? So we have um, a score for each user utterance span to the potential entity. And this formula is saying that uh, if the entity is popular on Wikipedia, it has lots of page views, people are reading it a lot, then that's more likely. And then also if the span is likely to be a text that refers to that entity, then it's more likely to be a link. So in our example, this means that we'd probably find that Banana Republic is more likely to be the clothing store than the political science concept, probably because more people are reading the Wikipedia article about the clothing store. We have another problem, which is that the automatic speech recognition service does sometimes make some errors. So for example, if the transcription says, I watched four V Ferrari, then that seems like an error. Users probably talking about the movie Ford V Ferrari. So the problem with our system here is that our scoring function is going to assign a zero score to this because there are no examples on Wikipedia where anyone wrote the text for V Ferrari and then linked that to the movie. So the way we fix this is we take the user's utterance and then we represent it phonetically. And then we do a kind of fuzzy matching to find what are some anchor texts that have a similar phonetic representation. And then this enables us to potentially match to the correct movie. So next, we're going to tell you a bit more about our response generators. So we have about um, 18 response generators in the bot, uh, but we're only going to tell you about the few most important ones in this presentation. So I mentioned earlier the neural chat response generator, and this uses a neural generative model to discuss the user's personal experiences and emotions. So here we're trying to achieve our design goal number four, that is showing empathy for the user's feelings and experiences. So we start off by asking a handwritten stars question. So an example of this is we ask, how are you feeling today? And then after this, we chat back and forth with the user and all the subsequent turns from the bot are generated by a GPT-2 media model, which we fine tuned on the empathetic dialogue data set. So here we ask, how's the user feeling? They say kind of bored. This was a more common response uh, due to the pandemic. And you know, we show some empathy and ask why they're bored and they say they're stuck inside and we suggest maybe you could go outside and so on. So we find that there are some uh, problems we encounter with this model. So some of the biggest problems are, we find it difficult to kind of ask questions that make sense. So sometimes the model asks redundant questions, like if the user says, I'm making soup for lunch, then we might say, what are you having for lunch? And we've already got that information. Another example is we make unfounded assumptions uh, that the uh, user didn't provide that information. So for example, if the user says, I played Frisbee today, and we say, I'm glad to hear you had fun playing Frisbee with your dog, but that's a hallucination. We never, um, the user never said anything about a dog. So we find that to avoid derailing the conversation, uh, we typically keep these conversations pretty short. They're usually only about three utterance pairs, uh, because if it goes on for too long, then the bot's quite likely to say one of these questions that doesn't make sense, and then that derails the conversation. The problem is that this limits the conversational depth. We're unable to talk about anything in a lot of detail if we can only go for about three turns. So I mentioned that we ask the users about how they're feeling. We find that the neural model works a lot better if the users give longer, more contentful utterances. But the problem is that sometimes users just say, I'm fine or okay or something very short. And then that makes it hard for us to find something interesting to say back. So we tried experimenting with preceding our question, how are you feeling today, by first the bot telling the user about its own feelings. So we might try saying, I'm feeling pretty positive today, or I'm feeling kind of down lately, before asking the user how they're feeling. We also tried getting the bot to share a personal anecdote before asking. So it might say something positive about going for a walk and how it felt good, or it might say something negative about why they're feeling down, missing their friends, finding it hard to focus. And again, this was inspired by the pandemic. So interestingly, we found that users give longer responses when the bot first shares its own emotions. And strangely, we found if the bot expresses that it's feeling down, then this led to longer user responses than if the bot said they were feeling positive. This might be because if we say we're feeling down, it kind of creates an atmosphere of more real honesty. So the users feel more able to share their own feelings. 
We also found that if the bot includes the personal anecdote, that also leads to longer user responses. Next, uh, I'll explain the wiki RG. So to support our goal of high coverage world knowledge, um, the wiki RG uses Wikipedia articles as grounding to discuss any entity that interests the user. Our goal is to allow the user to conversationally discover interesting information about any entity. So for example, uh, in this case, the user, uh, Wiki RG first <coughs> uh, remembers that the user had mentioned Neo and then back references Neo from an earlier conversation with a prompt. Uh, then in the next turn, uh, Wiki RG realizes that Neo is a specific kind of entity and gives an open-ended question, which is specific to fictional characters. These questions are designed to elicit contentful user responses, which can then be matched to specific sentences in the Wikipedia article using TF-IDF overlap. And in the final turn, um, the response generator gives a conversationally styled response and then switches to talking about Morpheus. Apart from this, as Abby mentioned previously, there are other cases. For instance, we talk about fun facts that we have scraped from uh, Today I Learned subreddit as well. One of our design goals was to provide information conversationally. And this response generator um, is a test bed for our conversational paraphrasing system. This system uh, has many goals. But the few important ones are one, to sort of summarize the knowledge snippet that you want to introduce in the conversation, uh, to stylize it so that the words and the phrasing that is used is much more colloquial than that is in Wikipedia. And then to also maintain conversational flow, referencing what the user had just said and then providing a path forward for the conversation. So given the uh, truncated conversational history uh, and some knowledge context as input, our conversational paraphrasing model outputs a natural sounding paraphrase uh, given the, of the knowledge context. So in this case, there's a long sentence about how Neo and Trinity successfully rescue Morpheus and uh, from heavily armed guards and so on. And so it's nicely paraphrased together um, into how the bot liked something about the movie. And uh, then it continues with some other open-ended questions. The challenges that we faced with this system is that uh, sometimes it had factual inaccuracies while copying over uh, content from the knowledge snippets. On the other hand, sometimes it would do verbatim copying and we kind of want to avoid that because that doesn't have a conversational styling to it. Next, we talk about opinion RG. So a design goal number four was that we want to show interest in the user's feelings and experiences. Exchanging opinions is a core part of social chit chat. It forms a stronger sense of personality and makes our bot seem more relatable. So uh, it is important that our bot can also express its opinions. The opinion RG's goal is to listen to users' opinion on certain topics and then reciprocate with its own opinions um, on these topics. We collect such opinions, both positive and negative opinions by querying a Twitter stream using a regex, which collects tweets of the form, I love or hate a certain topic because of a certain reason. These, the topic and reason can be any text. We collected over 900,000 tweets out of which we manually whitelisted around a thousand reasons across 100 popular topics. We, uh, to avoid speaking inappropriately about sensitive topics, we only whitelist uncontroversial en entities such as animals, foods, everyday experiences such as working from home, being sick, etc. We also ensured that all the reasons, including negative ones, are inoffensive and good spirited. So, for example, here we see that the user says, I love cats, and then our bot first understands user sentiment and then chooses to disagree with the user and going on to ask their reason uh, for why they like cats. And then in the next turn, interestingly, uh, opinion, our response generator emulates a change of mind, saying um, a reason why they might also like cats. So this kind of leads us to uh, the next part of it, which is whether to agree or to disagree with the user. Disagree, uh, disagreement is an unavoidable part of human-human conversations, and we hypothesize that occasional disagreement is necessary in order for our bot to have a convincing and individual personality. 
So we test this using three policies. One is always agree, where they, we always agree with the user sentiment. Second is listen first, disagree, where we first listen to the user's reason, but then disagree with it. And then finally, we have convinced agree, where we first disagree with user sentiment, but then change the opinion after listening to the user's reason. So to evaluate this, we ask the user, would you like to continue sharing opinions? And if they say yes, then that's a good sign. So comparing these three policies, we see that always agree has a continuation rate of 0.58. And between the two strategies that disagree, uh, convinced agree still maintains that continuation rate, whereas listen first disagree uh, reduces the continuation rate. So it goes on to say that disagreeing in a right way, in the sense of convinced agree, actually doesn't re reduce engagement, but it, but it brings variety to the table um, and also surprises the user in a nice way. So the final response generator I want to talk about is offensive user. Users sometimes give offensive or critical utterances, and our goal is to redirect the user from making more offensive comments towards the bot topics that the bot can discuss. So for example, sometimes the user, uh, some users say, I want to talk about sex, and we sort of want to handle this. We tried many strategies, um, and they are all listed here. The way we evaluate these strategies is to look at the reoffense rate, which is, is it, how likely is it that the user will have another offensive turn after our intervention? To explain the strategies a bit more, there are four main categories. Um, one is why, which is we ask the user, why did you say that? The next one is avoidance, where we say, I would rather not talk about that. Um, and then we have a counter where we say something like, this is a very suggestive thing to say. I don't think we should be talking about that. And then finally, we have an empathetic strategy where we say, if I could talk about it, I would, but I really couldn't, sorry to disappoint. So um, beyond this, we try two more add-ons to it. So first I'll explain the prompt where uh, we add the text in blue, uh, which is suggesting a new topic to go on to. And then the other strategy is we uh, refer to the user by name. Um, so we say, why did you say that Peter and so on. Now to understand the effects of all of these strategies, um, let's first look at what happens when we uh, uh, take, like when we refer to the user by name. So we see that um, for avoidance strategies, name works really well and the reoffense rate reduces drastically. Whereas when we ask why, then it actually increases a bit. We believe that we are actually, we might be motivating the user to defend themselves, which prolongs the offensive conversation, and especially when we ask them by name. And finally, uh, out of the four major strategies that I've introduced to you first, we found out that avoidance seemed to be the most um, effective in reducing the reoffense rate. And in particular, avoidance with name and prompt uh, was the most effective out of everything. Okay, moving on to some analysis and discussion of our social bot. First, uh, let's have a quick look at user engagement and trends. So on the y-axis, you would no you'll notice that we have rating and on the x-axis, we have various metrics of user engagement. So we observe that as the number of turns increases, um, the rating keeps going up, up until a certain point after which it reduces slightly. We believe that this might be because um, of the limitations in content of our bot. And after a certain while, it probably just gets more repetitive and users don't like it as much. And secondly, we, um, we thought that uh, a longer user utterance length is more indicative of a more satisfied user. But it turns out that the pattern is not that clear and mostly it's flat. Uh, we think that this might be because of our inability to handle uh, long user utterances in a meaningful way. And it reflects more a limitation of our bot than of general um, ways in which people like talking to bots. Uh, we also do some analysis of initiative using dialogue acts. So if you remember dialogue goal, uh, sorry, design goal one, we want the user to drive the conversation and uh, giving the user more initiative is how we sort of analyze it. So on the x-axis, uh, sorry, on the right side, you can see 
um, regression coefficients of various dialogue acts versus rating. So these are the dialogue acts that we got from our dialogue act classifier. Um, so first of all, we believe that questions indicate high user initiative. And if you look at questions uh, as in this uh, figure, we see that for yes, no questions, uh, it is positively associated with higher ratings, whereas it's not as clear for open question personal and open question factual, which typically have longer answers. <clears throat> we think that this might be because of uh, our inability to handle these open questions appropriately. And in the future, perhaps doing it better would be a, uh, would improve uh, user initiative quite a bit. Secondly, we look at statements and opinions, which we think are mu medium user initiative. This is because sometimes uh, users can volunteer new pieces of information, which is indicative of how much initiative they are trying to take. We see that uh, um, both of these dialogue acts have a positive correlation with rating. And finally, we look at answers. Um, so. We believe that answers are typically to questions which the bot asked and they indicate lower user initiative. So we see that positive and negative answers are correlated positively and negatively respectively with the rating. And we believe that that's just because um, positive answers are more reflective of the times we understood the user right and suggested the right topic, whereas negative answers is quite the opposite. Finally, other answers are also slightly lower in correlation with the rating. And then we look at broad topical coverage. So if you remember our design goal two, we want to talk about uh, any topic, chat about any topic. And so in this diagram, uh, we see on the X axis, different uh, ranges of page views for different entities, which are essentially Wikipedia articles and we take it as a proxy for different popularity levels. And on the y-axis, you see the percentage of conversations, which include entities from one of these bins. So what we see is that the percentage of conversations in which users initiated the discussion of entities uh, with lower page views is quite significant. In particular, 33% of conversations had at least one entity with less than 8,000 page views. Moreover, conversations with rare entities were rated better, an average of 3.88 compared to those without. And uh, in general, we saw that we had seven and a half distinct entities on average per conversation. Finally, um, as to, uh, to round up the analysis, uh, we look at RG performance. And first, to, uh, the first thing we notice is that good RGs are better than bad RGs. So, yay. Uh, but then, interestingly, we also see that scripted RGs are still performing slightly better than open-ended RGs, despite our attempts to improve open-ended RGs um, in quality. And finally, we see that neural fallback, which is a replacement for fallback, uh, improves the um, rating uh, of the conversations in general. All right, so for discussion and future work, uh, first up is full stack NLP. So most NLP research focuses on self-contained tasks. However, an open domain social bot is by no means a self-contained task. Our social bot is a tapestry of many such components requiring a deep understanding of each component and how they should work together, a setting we call full stack NLP. Often the inputs and outputs to these components are interdependent, which leads to cascading errors. While we have made many design choices which delay hard decisions in the pipeline, the next avenues for advancing state of the art would be to research, uh, do, to do research on models which perform these tasks jointly and methods which enable training over multiple interdependent tasks with only a small amount of joint supervision. Next is the issue of domain shift. As a recurring problem, we found that many existing NLP resources didn't well work well out of the box. The main reason for this is that the training data for these resources is misaligned with our setting. However, a deeper reason is that the constantly changing nature of dialogue agents also affects it. Even for an extremely related resource, domain shift was a problem and recent advances in online learning and meta learning could provide uh, useful long-term solutions for this problem. 
Next is uh, the issue of conflicting topics and user intimacy. So bot human conversations are fundamentally different to human human conversations. Users can be adversarial and deliberately test the bot's boundaries. As, as social bot designers, we would like to avoid controversies. So we apply strict but overly simplistic methods to block off sensitive topics. However, this rules out sincere conversation about difficult topics. We observe that users are actually quite resilient to conflict and can find disagreement stimulating. We also found out that emotional intimacy is reciprocal. Users are more inclined to share their feelings after the bot has shared its own. So going forward, we should continue to take seriously the dangers of speaking inappropriately, but also keep in mind the cost to engagement and to intimacy of not engaging in difficult topics. And finally, as part of our goal to support user initiative, we focused on asking the users to find out which topics interested them. However, this puts pressure on the user to think of a response, especially given the time constraints of Alexa devices. Thus, we found that our attempts to let the user take more initiative unfortunately led to decision fatigue. Separately, our ability to support user initiative was limited by our ability to answer follow-up questions and to correctly understand long user utterances. On balance, we found that asking the user open-ended questions about interesting topics was a good strategy, easier to handle than spontaneous user questions, and less pressuring than asking the users to name topics. We see an opportunity for future work to build systems which listen more to the user's knowledge rather than only providing knowledge. So this concludes our presentation. Um, you, you can go online and check out our technical article Neural Generation Meets Real People um, for more details. Thanks. Hi, my name is Jan Pichl, and together with my colleagues Peter Marek and Jakub Konrad, we would like to present our social bot called Alquist 2. Our bot placed third in the recent Alexa Prize Grand Challenge 3, and we won the second prize during both of the previous years of the competition. Our presentation starts with a brief history that led us to the ideas for the current bot. After that, we will describe the most relevant parts of the system to you. Okay, let's do it. I'll start with the evolution of Alquist bot through the years of the competition. This brief description gives you an insight into the system goals and how it was evolving based on the previous experience and what is the primary motivation of this year's contribution. During the first year of Alexa Prize competition, we quickly discovered that the bot could not be created in an end-to-end -end way. Therefore, we designed dialogue structures suitable for each topic. These structures were implemented as state automata guiding a user through the conversation. As we evaluated the user experience, it showed that conversations are too scripted and don't allow much flexibility. Moreover, they were hard to maintain. Based on these findings, we redesigned our board during the second year of the competition. We introduced smaller graph structures, each covering only a small piece of each topic. Each structure has its own dialogue management model trained on the data generated using the design graph structures. We group these structures into so-called topic nodes, allowing more flexibility during the conversation. This approach works very well for cooperative users, but still lacks the ability to handle unexpected utterances. To address the users who want to drive the conversation in a proactive way, as well as the long tail topics, we introduce a conversational knowledge graph with atomic dialogue structures this year. In the next slides, we will describe how to use the knowledge graph to enhance the system and provide more engaging conversations. The conversational knowledge graph is meant to contain only the information about the topics the bot is capable of talking about. For this purpose, we designed a custom ontology inspired schema.org and EV ontology. These ontologies, however, cover only the factual information about the entities. To make it more conversational, we enriched the ontology by the user and bot nodes representing both participants of the conversation. And additionally, 
by the preference relations. We can then easily add connections between bot or user to the specific entity to capture relationship mentioned in the conversation. Now we have the ontology, but we need data to fill the knowledge graph with. We use snapshot of the wiki data to initialize the graph. It allows the bot to use plenty of real-world factoid information in the conversations with the users. Using the standard database, such as Wikidata, also allows us to link entities mentioned in the utterances to the database IDs using existing tools. Additionally, we needed to implement a custom entity linking mechanism only for our custom data, which are not included in Wikidata. Moreover, we are continuously enriching the static data by the dynamic content, such as new movies, etc. The key points in the dialogue are the users and bot nodes. In most of the dialogue terms, the bot works with one of these nodes. For example, if a user says, I like matrix, we want to link I to the user node, in addition to the matrix being mapped to the movie matrix in the knowledge graph. Now, we have the user entity, matrix entity, and property likes. The bot then stores the fact in the knowledge graph, and it is ready to work with it in the upcoming conversations. We focus primarily on the preferences-based relations between entities and the user, such as like, love, dislike, hate, has favorite, has opinion, etc. The preferences of the bot are manually pre-filled for the most discussed entities. If a user asks a question regarding an unknown preference, the bot can reply with a generic answer. Additionally, we can add the most asked preferences based on the logs and reuse the preferences most commonly mentioned by users. We also use the knowledge graph to generate training data for NLU models. To do so, we have the knowledge graph annotated with template sentences using custom annotation properties. The annotation properties are assigned to a relation connecting two entities. Each relation has domain and range entity that defines a direction of the relation. The annotation property describes the sentence in natural language that can be expressed using the corresponding relation. The domain and range entities are masked in the annotation property. The annotation properties are also divided based on the dialogue act. For example, for the property likes, and the dialogue act statement, we want to have sentence domain, domain likes range. And analogically, for the question, the sentence would be does domain like range. And combining these atomic structures, we are able to create more complex uh, utterances. And it is important to note that the data can be used to train both understanding and generative models. We observed during the previous installment of Alexa Prize competition that a noticeable part of users' messages had the following structure. Yes, I like movie. What is your favorite song? Or, do you like sports? Because I do. Or, let's switch the topic. I would like to chat about movies. As we can see, those messages consist of two parts. We call these parts segments. Those segments have different meanings and intents. Thus, it's not enough to handle them together as one message. We have to process each segment because there might be some new information that we can store into a conversational knowledge graph or some questions we have to handle. We came up with the idea of action to be able to process all segments. An action is an atomic unit which takes the role in the processing of segment. Action contains NAU annotations and links to the adjacency pair, which produces an answer. There are multiple types of actions. Action contains following NLU annotations. An entity and property of conversational knowledge graph and dialogue act. The entity tells us what the user is talking about. In the question, what is the capital of Czech Republic? We recognize the entity Czech Republic, which we link into our knowledge graph. We now know all the information we have stored about the Czech Republic, which we can use in the dialogue. 
property of conversational knowledge graph specifies which property user is talking about. In the question, what is the capital of Czech Republic, we know that the user is talking about property capital of. We can look into the conversational knowledge graph now. We can find that the property capital of going from the entity Czech Republic is Prague, and we can use it to form an answer. We can read information from the conversational knowledge graph as well as store information into it too. Dialogue Act is the last NLU annotation stored in action. Dialogue Act tells us whether the user asks an open question like what is the capital of Czech Republic? Yes, no question like do you like sports? Or if the user informs us about some fact like I have a sister. If a user asks a question, we read from the conversational knowledge graph. If the user informs us, we store information into it instead. Also, we respond differently to different dialogue acts. There will be a different answer to open and yes-no questions, for example. Thus, dialogue act determines whether we will use read or write operation on the conversational knowledge graph and the type of response we produce. Now that we have an action containing entity Alquist, property favorite movie, and dialogue act open question, we know that we should find Alquist's favorite movie in the conversational knowledge graph. Furthermore, we use a particular adjacency pair to form a response. However, how do we create an action? How do we know how many we will need? We use segmentation to determine how many actions we will need to process the user's message. Segmentation takes the output of automatic speaker recognition and split it into segments. For example, yes, I like sport, do you like music? is split into two segments. Yes, I like sport and do you like music? We have to keep in mind that the problem of segmentation is not as easy as splitting the input according to punctuation. Some of the ASR systems produce se sequence of words without any punctuation marks. Once we have segments, we create action for each and we run NLU algorithms to obtain entities, properties, and dialogue acts for each action independently. Thus, thanks to the segmentation, we know how to split input messages into actions, which we process independently. However, that is not all. One of the big problems of any conversational application is the noisy output of ASR. Typically, when we do not have clear ASR output, LLU components make errors that further propagate up to the point that the final response does not make any sense. The authors of ASR try to fight this problem by providing several recognition hypotheses together with their confidence from which we can choose. However, there is a problem. How do we pick the right hypothesis? We came up with the solution which utilizes the actions. The first step of our solution is to run the segmentation on all hypotheses of ASR. In the second step, we create action for each segment in each hypothesis. In the last step, we select the best ASR hypothesis based on the combined score of ASR confidence and scores of an action of that particular ASR hypothesis. We process only actions which are part of the ASR hypothesis, which we select based on the score. How do we calculate the ASR hypothesis score? The first part is the confidence of the ASR hypothesis itself. The second part is the combined score of all actions present in the ASR hypothesis. How do we calculate the score for action? We have entity, property, and dialogue act annotations in each action. A machine learning algorithm typically produces these annotations together with its confidence. We can use these confidence scores 
combine them and calculate the score for the action. Now that we have ASR hypothesis confidences and scores for all actions, we can calculate the score of all ASR hypotheses and pick the best one for further processing. The idea behind this is that the best ASR hypothesis will lead to the most confident NLU annotations in all its actions. In reality, the processing of NLU annotations is time-consuming. We process only the top N ASR hypothesis for this reason. Moreover, some of the scores of actions are very low. We decided to filter such actions based on the threshold. Thus, we do not send them all for further processing. To recap the row of actions in Alquist, we observed that users are telling us many facts and asking multiple questions in a single message. We split messages into segments for this reason. Each segment contains one action. An action is an atomic unit which contains entity, property and dialog act and maps it into an adjacency pair which is responsible for the production of response. Moreover, we also use actions to determine the least noisy ASR hypothesis. You have already heard the words adjacency pair, so let me now explain what they are and why we decided to integrate them to the core of our system. Adjacency pairs are sequences of two utterances that are often present in the conversation. We define them as a pair of utterances that have the following properties. They are adjacent to one another in the conversation. One follows immediately after another in most cases. Each of them is produced by a different speaker. Or in our case, one is produced by the bot and the other is produced by the user or vice versa. They have the first part and the second part, meaning that their order is not interchangeable. The first part of the utterance often requires a specific second part or one of possible several second parts. An example of an adjacency pair can be simple greeting, greeting, such as the speaker A says good morning and the speaker B, B would answer morning. Or it can be a question answer pair. The speaker A would say, do you like movies? And the speaker B would respond, yes, I do. Chaining these pairs together can create a naturally flowing conversation. We want our subdialogues to be made of one or several adjacency pairs. This way, it is simpler for us to predict user responses due to adjacency pairs often having expected specific types of answers. First, we wanted to test how prevalent adjacency pairs are in conversation to see how viable would building a dialogue from them be in the first place. We analyzed all conversations in the multivoz dataset. For each entry in the conversation, we have noted the dialogue act of the entry and the dialogue act of the following entry as well, as noted who is currently speaking. We have then created a list of dialogue act pairs that fulfill all four previously mentioned conditions, and we use them as adjacency pair candidates. The results show that as expected, the dialogues have the adjacency pair structure. For example, almost one fourth of statements made by one speaker are immediately followed by some sort of minor acknowledged band by the second speaker. Or, when the first speaker asks a W question, this question is in 59% of cases followed by a statement, usually the answer, by the second speaker. These patterns correspond to adjacency pairs as described previously. We aim to recreate a similar structure of conversation within our system, where conversation consists of adjacency pairs that are then chained together to provide an engaging and natural conversation. We have defined a set of adjacency pair groups where each group contains a set of similar adjacency pairs with the same opening utterance but a different closing utterance. You can see these examples on the screen. There are 17 groups in total, and they are divided into two categories, user-initiated adjacency pairs, which consists of 13 groups, and both-initiated adjacency pairs, which consists of four groups.
When the system detects a user action that corresponds to an adjacency pair opening, it produces a closing action based on the dete detected adjacency pair group using the context of the conversation and the information accessible in the knowledge graph. For example, when user asks the system, do you like California? Which is a user post question. The question is positive. It is a yes, no question. Alquist selects an answer based on its profile in the knowledge base and based on the uh, positive user yes, no question adjacency pair group. So the answer can be, for example, affirmative answer, or it can be a negative answer, or Alquist can simply say that it doesn't know which would be an inform unknown answer. Alquist is also able to initiate adjacency pairs in the conversation. It might ask, what would you like to talk about? Which is a bot open positive question, where it expects the, expects the user to either answer the question with an inform answer or say that the user doesn't know, which is an inform unknown answer. If the user provides the closing utterance for the adjacency pair, Alquist updates the knowledge base accordingly. Otherwise, it logs the unclosed adjacency pair for statistical purposes. We aim to combine both of these conversational patterns into an, our conversation, where the system both closes the adjacency pair that was initiated previously by the user and also provides an opening statement for a new adjacency pair to allow the conversation to keep flowing. To achieve this, we divide the bot utterance into three parts, handle action, that provides a closing statement for the current adjacency pair, if any. Then what we call a fun fact action, which aims to provide an additional information about the current topic, either in the form of a fun fact or a piece of information related to the user or all quest found in the knowledge graph. And finally, a forward action, which initiates a new adjacency pair. An example of this pattern of conversation can be User asks, do you like California? To which the Alquest bot would answer, yes, I do. That is a handle action. Then it would continue. I heard that San Diego, California is known as the avocado capital of the world. That would be a fun fact action. And finally, Alquist would add, speaking of, do you like avocados? Which would be a forward action. To which user can again close the open adjacency pair by saying, Yes, I do. Often, when contextually appropriate, after closing the adjacency pair with a handle action, the old subdialog system can take over and provide fun fact and forward actions by initiating a subdialog for the current topic as well. Finally, let me summarize the main improvements and innovations of the Alquest 2020 system. Based on previous years of the competition, we have focused our efforts to improve the experience for users who prefer to be more proactive in the conversation and like to take initiative, while also retaining the last year's subdialogue functionality. To do this, we created a conversational knowledge base, which with custom ontology focused on knowledge about the user and Alquest. We de developed a system of handling user utterances by dividing a user utterance into segments and defining actions that each segment represents to correctly handle all parts of the user response. We described a set of adjacency pairs frequently occurring in conversations with our system and directly connected them to actions. This allows us to easily create more elaborate conversational patterns from elementary units while maintaining the pace of the conversation. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you would like to follow our journey going forward, you can find us on social media at Alquist AI, and you can find the links to the papers that describe our system either there or with the QR code that is displayed on the screen. Thank you.